Well, welcome to our third and most, uh, perhaps most exciting trig graph of all. Um, we've already really done a really nice job with sine and cosine. We've played around with not only the amplitude and the frequency and the period, but we also started doing vertical shifts the other day, and we tried to identify the max and min minimum points. And now we're going to tackle the tangent graph. And as we kind of build up and get ready to introduce you to this crazy, crazy curve, I want to I want to try to set the stage here, and I want to throw four angles at you and ask you what do they have in common. I want to talk about 45 degrees. I want to talk about 135 degrees. I want to talk about 225 degrees. And I want to talk about 315. What do these four angles have in common? Okay. What do they have in common? Well, hopefully you're you're screaming the answer here at your at your screen, and it's the they all have the same reference angle. Okay. Um, and I'm going to use our sub theta. And uh, just to convince yourself here, let's see, we know that 45 degrees splits that first quadrant in half, and then 135 is right over here, and, and of course the distance from that terminal ray down to here is 45, 225 is right here, and that distance there is 45, and then 315 would then split the fourth quadrant in half. And that's the distance right there. Just a quick review on your reference angle. That's the degrees of separation uh, between the terminal ray and the nearest x-axis. So how does that help us today? Well, when we go to evaluate them, for instance, we know that the tangent of 45 degrees is one of our favorite values. It's 1. So when I go to evaluate the tangent of 135, well, let's see, that's equivalent to the tangent of 45 with one exception. 135 lives in the second quadrant. And all students tip cows. Okay, when you're in the second quadrant, only sign's positive. So I'm going to have to negate that answer, which leads me to a negative one. If I want to evaluate the tangent of 225, well, again, the same reference angle, tangent of 45. 225 lives in the third quadrant, so I'm going to keep it positive, and I end up with a 1. And then last but not least, tangent of 315 degrees is equivalent to the tangent of 45. However, fourth quadrant forces me to negate it, and I end up with a negative 1. So those four values right there are going to be very special values today when we get to go graphing, just because they're so friendly and nice to work with. And last bit of review I want to throw at you is that uh, how many radians is 45 degrees? That's equivalent to pi over 4, right? Now when you go to convert the other ones, it's really simple. You just ask yourself, well, how many times bigger is 135 compared to 45? Well, it's three times bigger, so we'll just go 3 pi over 4. If I wanted to take 225 degrees and convert him to radians, the quick shortcut is to say, well, 225 is 5 times bigger than 45, so it would just be 5 pi over 4. And then the last one, 315 degrees, that's 7 times bigger than 45 degrees, so we'll just go 7 pi over 4. And what you have here is a collection uh, that is very similar. Hopefully you've identified a pattern, and that's what all great mathematicians are able to do. They're able to look at a, you know, and see these patterns uh, clearly. We, what we have here is the odd multiples, uh, I don't know if it's going to squeeze in, it, of pi over 4. So we've got 1 pi over 4, and then 3 pi over 4, and 5 pi over 4, and 7 pi over 4. So it's all the odd multiples of pi over 4, and that's a quick way to remember the really important values for tangent. All right, as you start to sketch this uh, graph down in your notebook, uh, you'll notice that the domain on the given picture is from 0 to 360 degrees, uh, or we could have said 0 to 2 pi radians, it doesn't matter. Um, I want to first talk about the scaling here that we've used, and we're going to start to use graph paper here um, in class, and when you're using graph paper, I like to say every three blocks on that x-axis is equivalent to pi over 2 radians, or 90 degrees. All right, and then and then the y-axis we'll tweak that from time to time. Usually we'll do every two blocks is one unit, uh, but sometimes that'll vary. And uh, so we'll just say two blocks up is one, two blocks down is negative one. But here's what I really want to talk about. Why do you think we counted by three blocks on the x-axis? Well, what was really convenient is that first block is 30, and the second block is 60. And then you just continue to count by 30. So after 90, we've got 120, and then 150, and then 180, and 210, 240, 270, 300, and 330. 
Those are all crazy important uh, degree measures. Those are awesome ones to remember. Now the other really special one is this one that's right in the midway point of 30 and 60. And that's your 45 degree rascal. And then halfway between 120 and 150 is your 135. And those are going to be really special as we alluded to in the last slide. Halfway between 210 and 240 is, you guessed it, 225. And then halfway between 300 and 330 is 315. And those are the ones that are going to be really helpful today. All right. Um, let's see. The next thing I need to know. Their tangent has a really special feature, and it has two vertical asymptotes on this domain. Okay, and a vertical asymptote is kind of like this invisible dotted line that shows up on your graph. Well, it's not invisible to us when we draw it; it'll be invisible on our calculator. But we have to draw these in, and that's the first thing I always draw when I do my tangent graph: are these two vertical asymptotes, one at ninety, one at two seventy. The other really helpful thing is that the tangent of zero is zero. Uh, the tangent of 180 is 0, and the tangent of 360 is 0. All right, last thing. We already said that the tangent of 45 had a value of 1, so that means my graph has a height of 1. We already said that the tangent of 135 was negative 1, the tangent of 225 was positive 1, and the tangent of 315 was negative 1. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. What I've got now is enough information for me to go graph my tangent picture. All right, so here's what it's going to look like. We're going to start at the origin, and we're going to be kind of exhibit some concave up concavity. So it's not a straight line, and what it does is it kind of curls up towards positive infinity. And then, let's see here. Let's see if we can curve this just right. Kind of goes like that. So, okay, and then the last one's going to kind of come this way. So be careful that you're not drawing straight lines. They should have some curvature to them. And to be um, real specific here, this one that we started with here is concave up. I just want you to put a little label there. Then from 90 to 180, we're concave down. From 180 to 270, we're concave up. And then from 270 to 360, we're concave down. And that'll help you a ton with it when it comes to the curvature and making sure that we're bending you know, just the right way. All right, now I want to summarize. Now that we've seen the picture of tangent, I want to summarize some of the key properties of this graph. First of all, the amplitude is a very fuzzy topic uh, just because it doesn't have a finite height. What you'll notice here is this graph shoots uh, straight up towards the sky. So sometimes we can either say that the amplitude is infinity because it goes so high, or sometimes we'll just say it doesn't exist. Um, th those two choices, you'll never see the same two choices on a multiple choice exam. And uh, you'll see if you see one or the other, that's the right answer. Um, let's see, how long does it take to complete one cycle? That's a good question. You know, what is one cycle? Okay, if you start here at 90 degrees and you follow the curve all the way up to here, what I have traced in red, that's one cycle. So what, how many radians is that? Well, it started at 90 um, and it went all the way to 270. So that's 180 degrees for one cycle or in radians that would be pi radians to complete one cycle. A couple other key components, these vertical asymptote things, these dotted lines right here. All right, those are kind of iffy. So what we're saying is there is a vertical asymptote at 90 degrees and 270 degrees, uh, which is really pi over 2 radians and 3 pi over 2 radians. And in fact, all odd multiples of pi over 2, So, if we continued to do the graph. If we went beyond 360, the next asymptote would be at 5 pi over 2. The next asymptote after that would be 7 pi over 2. If we went backwards, the next asymptote would be at negative pi over 2 and then negative 3 pi over 2. So every odd multiple of pi over 2 is going to be an asymptote. And then the last most important thing is going to be the roots. Where are the roots? Um, let's see, just ask yourself where the graph crossed the x-axis. We had a root at x equals 0. Uh, we had a root at x equals 180 degrees. And we also had a root at x equals 360 degrees. If we translated those to radians, it would be 0 radians, pi radians, and 2 pi radians. So make sure we know the, where the vertical asymptotes are. Make sure you know where the roots are. And that will really go a long ways with getting your tangent graph right. Okay, I've imported one more piece of graph paper, and I like this one. I found this one on Google the other day, and uh, the reason I liked it is it kind of kind of gives you a reference point of how the, the radians in terms of pi fit in with the radians that are in terms of whole numbers, because we've seen a variety of problems last week 
where sometimes the domain is from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, we saw another question last week where the domain was 0 to 2, and that kind of threw us for a loop because it wasn't in terms of pi anymore. So um, this is just kind of shows you that pi over 2 is a number that's bigger than 1 but smaller than 2. It also shows you right here that pi is obviously a little bigger than 3, 2 pi is a little bigger than 6, and so forth. But, you know, how do I go about graphing tangent, and exactly what order do I do it in? The first thing I always do is I always identify my vertical asymptotes. So, and I probably shouldn't have covered that pi over 2 up. Let me erase that. Okay. Um, and then I put my other asymptote right at 3 pi over 2. So, and that's what I'm going to expect to see out of you in class tomorrow, is I want to see you putting these asymptotes in there right away. That's your first move every time you go to work on the tangent graph. The second thing I do is I identify my roots. There's a root at negative 2 pi, negative pi, 0 pi, and 2 pi. And then last but um, not least, I'll take care of my 45. I think 45 degrees or pi over 4 is about right there. So there's 1. There's 135, so I need a negative 1. There's 225, so I need a positive 1. And there's 315, so I need a negative 1. And then we'll do the same thing on the flip side here. Whoops, I screwed that up. Not right there. should be down here. And that right there should be up and then down and then up. It's just very cyclical, very repeatable. Uh, we're concave down and then we switch and we're concave up. Remember, when you switch concavity, that's called a point of inflection. All right, and that's concave down. And one more and another half. All right, so that's what tangent would look like if we went all the way from negative 2 pi to positive 2 pi. I just want to emphasize that we do asymptotes first, root second, and then the special values of 45 third. The other thing we're going to do in class tomorrow besides just tangent is we're also going to kind of try to combine everything we've learned with regards to sine and cosine all at the same time because there really isn't, I mean, once you get that tangent graph down once, there really isn't a lot of manipulating that we do with it. Um, you know, we don't tweak the amplitude and frequency and stuff as much as we do the sine and cosine. So we're going to do a big review tomorrow. And what I want you to try to do, and the key here is on the same set of axes. I want you to sketch this graph um, in your notebook and work on doing the graph from 0 to 2 pi of these two graphs. Now what you'll notice is because of the domain they gave you, you could pretty much take this side of the y-axis and just throw it out. Okay, so we'll just kill that half and just work on 0 to 2 pi. Hit the pause button, go graph them, come on back, see what you got. Okay, for the cosine function here, I said that the amplitude was 2. I said the frequency was 1 half, uh, which meant that the period was 4 pi. And so I'm going to go ahead and graph that. I know I've got to start really high up here at 2. And I'm only going to see half of the cosine curve. So I'm starting to visualize. It's going to start with a max and end with a min. And halfway between the max and min is a root. And what I have here is I have a graph that's concave down. And then it switches and it becomes concave up. And that's what 2 cosine of 1 half looks like. How about sine of 2x? Well, this time I've got an amplitude of 1 because of that guy. I've got a frequency of 2 and a period of pi because 2 pi divided by 2 is pi. So here's what I'm thinking. I know that the sine curve, I've got to be completed with my first cycle by the time I get to pi right there. So I'm going to start with a root and end with a root. Halfway between those two roots is another root. Halfway between the first two roots is a max, and halfway between the second and third root is a min. So I'm going to just draw that as nice as I can. There's my first sine curve, and I'm just going to repeat that cyclical process all over again, and I get a really nice second sine curve. Um, and a, lot of, a very common question with one like this is to ask you where the graphs intersect, where do they equal each other, and we could say that they intersected right at pi if they asked me for that question. All right, I want to see you try the same thing here again. We're going same set of axes um, with a domain of 0 to 2 pi. And I want to see you hit the pause button. And there, there's basically kind of a part A and a part B. Graphing is the part A. And then there's this part B question where it says how many points satisfy the equation, yada, yada, yada. And we can talk about that as well. But I want you to really get the graphing down. Hit pause. Come on back. See if we got the same thing. Well, the first thing I did is, again, just like the last one, I kind of I scribbled out the left side of the y-axis just because the domain was 0 to 2 pi. Uh, for 
three cosine of 2x. I've got an amplitude of 3, a frequency of 2, and a period of pi. So here's the deal. Uh, by the time I get to pi, I have to have completed my first cycle. Cosine starts with a max and ends with a max. Halfway between those two maxes is a min, and halfway between a max and a min is a root. So I need to make sure that your roots are right at pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4. That's very important that they're precise. Concave down, concave up, 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 switch, concave down. Now I'm just going to repeat that sequence all over again. Very repetitive, very predictable. Concave down, switch, concave up, 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 switch, concave down. Okay, so that's what 3 cosine of 2x looks like. And I don't want you to make it any bubblier than I made it. Uh, I'm kind of right on the edge of acceptability there. In fact, I would say my second graph is a little, uh, the cycle from pi to 2 pi is a little more pleasing. Um, all right, now for the sine curve. I think this is an easier one to draw. I'll work it over here. We've got an amplitude of 1. I've got a frequency of 1 half. Only going to see half the curve. And then we've got a period of 4 pi. So here's what I know that sine curve starts with a root. And in this case, he's going to end with a root. And halfway between those two roots is a max. And it's going to be a very low max. So just a real subtle curve like that all completely concave down the entire time. And now you're wondering, what the heck does this part B asking me? How many points satisfy this equation? Well, all we're doing is taking the, the cosine curve and setting it equal to the sine curve. So in your notebook, make a comment that all they're really asking for is how many points of intersection are there? That's all they're asking. I know it doesn't sound like that initially, but that's all they're asking for. I would say there's one point right there, second point, third point, fourth point. I would say there's a grand total of four points that satisfy that equation. All right, the really only uh, trick to this one is that we're changing the domain. Instead of 0 to pi, or I'm sorry, 0 to 2 pi, we're going from negative pi to pi. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a firm line here at negative pi, and I'm going to ignore everything to the left of that one. And then I'm going to draw another firm line. These are not vertical asymptotes. These are just firm boundaries. And I'm going to cut off everything to the right of that one. So by the time I'm done graphing, I'm only going to see negative pi to pi. So again, great time. Hit the pause button, challenge yourself, and see if you can nail these. And we'll see if you're as good as you think you are right now. All right, I'm going to work the cosine graph here. And it looks like he's got an amplitude of 3, a frequency of 1 because of that coefficient. And that means he's got a period of 2 pi. Now, again, I think if the interval was 0 to 2 pi, it would be a lot easier. So if I start at 0, we're going to start real high at 3. And by the time we get to pi, I'm going to see half of that cycle. So what I'm going to do is I've got to start with a max, end with a min, and halfway between there, those two is a root. I'm going to be concave down, and then I switch, and I'm concave up. Notice I did everything to the right side of the y-axis first, and then I'm going to kind of take a step back, look at the pattern, and then be able to predict that the cosine curve then does this on the left side of the y-axis. I've got a root at negative pi over 2 and a min at negative pi. All right, now it's time to work the sine curve right here. Let's see, we got an amplitude of 1, I've got a frequency of 2, and a period of pi. So I am going to see one cycle from 0 to pi. I've got a sine curve that's going to start with a root, end with a root, and have another root halfway between those two. I've got a max here, a min here, and oh, beautiful sine curve. And then I'm just going to, again, take a step back, ask myself, because of the cyclic, uh, repetitive nature of this curve, what's it going to do? Well, we're going to go to a min, a root, a max, and a, another root. And let's see, my curve's going to look like this. Okay, here's a really interesting question that they posed to us in Part B, per se. Is they said, okay, find all values for which 3 cosine of x minus sine of 2x equals 0. The first thing I want to do is I want to add sine of 2x to the other side. So let's rewrite the equation and say, when does 3 cosine of x equal the sine of 2x? Now they're not just asking me how many times they intersect with each other, how many times they equal. They want to actually know the values for which these intersections happen. That's a lot different than the last question when they just asked me how many intersections there were. So here's the deal. There are two intersections, and I need to establish or identify their exact values. And I would say negative pi over 2 is the first intersection, and positive pi over 2 is the second intersection. And that would be my solution set for this particular problem.